It's a name that's familiar to a lot of St. Louisans. It's on this children's home. It's on this street. It's on an annual parade, all named for Annie Malone. It's also a name that comes up during Black History Month a lot, and appropriately, because it's a fascinating story of rags to riches. But like a lot of interesting stories about interesting people, over time, they sometimes get boiled down to a couple of paragraphs, if that, or maybe just a name on a sign. About 10 years ago, we set out to find out about the real Annie Malone. And fortunately, we found some people who were more than willing to help us out. You start your search in the Ville, where you find her name on the monument listing famous African Americans who had lived here. In the 20th century, this had become, in segregated St. Louis, a cultural and educational center for the black community. But Annie Malone wasn't so much shaped by the Ville as much as it was shaped by her. In 1917, she built the Poro College Building, the headquarters of her black hair and beauty care empire, which had tens of thousands of sales agents around the country, even the world. It was a business that made her a millionaire. Although the business and the building are long gone, there is now an Annie Malone Drive and the Annie Malone Children and Family Center, which sponsors the annual Annie Malone Parade. This place really owes its existence, right, to Annie Malone's money, right? Absolutely. this building. This building. She gave the first $10,000 that made this building so. Yeah. Uh, but when Resource Development was... Director Linda Nance Did set out a few years ago to write an article about the real Annie Malone, she was surprised at just how little there was to go on. Um, we, we have a uh, things that we found in different places, uh -huh. uh, and there's no central place for uh, information about Annie Malone, and that's a bit of a problem. We, yeah. we want to make sure that that does become so. One reason the archives got scattered is because Malone moved her home and her business operations to Chicago in 1930, but she remained involved with the children's home and came to St. Louis regularly for the rest of her life. I remember as a person. <laughs> Mildred Boyd is one of those people who is working to keep the Annie Malone story from slipping away. Her grandmother was friends with Malone. This is a newspaper photograph of the two of them in Hot Springs, Arkansas. But Boyd was just a little girl. But she was kind of scary to me. And she wore a lot of those big hats, and then they, they would just really frighten me a lot. <clears throat> you knew she was an important lady. Oh, yes. But even she didn't realize until recently just how impressive Annie Malone's life was. Not until she ran across a copy of a 1927 booklet entitled Poro in Pictures. The book tells the official Annie Malone biography and company history. How Annie Malone was born in Metropolis, Illinois, was orphaned, went to high school in Peoria where she began to mix up her first batches of hair straightening. She moved to the Metro East and started her business in this building in Lovejoy or Brooklyn, Illinois. In 1902, she moved across the river to St. Louis to the Mill Creek neighborhood, first on Market Street and then into a bigger building on Pine. She was developing not just hair and beauty products for black women, she was developing a sales system. Women were trained as agents and not just in selling door to door, but also in demonstrating the use of the Poro products. The business was so successful that Malone built, at the cost of a half a million dollars, her new Poro Beauty College in the Ville, at the time just the up-and-coming African-American neighborhood. She was a force here in the Ville neighborhood. She helped to make sure that there were paved roads. Um, she was very, very instrumental in making sure her community grew, and that was, that was a really important thing for me. Um, community developer, definitely she was. Uh, community supporter, definitely she was. And I, I think that speaks to the kind of spirit she personally had. I also thought that it was very interesting that uh, tornado, and I, um, I believe 27, uh, very, very devastating uh, tornado for which the poor old college became uh, a rescue center. They provided food, they provided clothing, they provided medical assistance. Um, and the city worked with Annie Malone to do exactly that, and she provided that help for thousands of people. In later years, after the Poro operations moved to Chicago, Homer G. Phillips, St. Louis's Negro Hospital, would be the dominant institution, employment center, and source of pride in the Ville. Homer G. opened in 1937. Poro College had opened here 20 years before, 
employing, according to one source, 175 people, many in jobs that African Americans could have never gotten downtown. So we had a, a monstrous operations, right. and that's the part that I want other people to know about, that it wasn't just about hair, it was about a lot of things that went on in there. I think about all the jobs. She had a sewing room where they made the uniforms for not only the employees in the building, but they made the uniforms for the college students that, went, that came in to learn cosmetology. Here in the Ville headquarters, Poro products were manufactured, orders were taken from agents, packed up, and shipped out. And inside the Poro building and open to the community was an ice cream parlor, a bakery, a roof garden that was the site of many a party and wedding reception. And there was a theater. They had plays, they did Shakespeare, Aunt Marian Anderson appeared there, and it was really quite fabulous, really was. And then after uh, Poro moved out? The you... Amethyst Theater took it. Right, mm -hmm. and you went there? You oh, yeah. there? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yes, my first movie. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Annie Malone in her life had her troubles a highly publicized and costly divorce in 1927, and lawsuits, tax, and financial issues. But throughout her life, she gave. To her church, to the Negro YMCA and YWCA, she backed prohibition as a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, donated to black colleges, funded scholarships for Negro students. And of course, her contribution made it possible for what was then called the St. Louis Colored Orphans Home to build here in the Ville in 1922. Even after moving to Chicago, Annie Malone visited regularly and continued to serve as board president until 1943. A few years later, the name was changed to the Annie Malone Home. I remember her being here, um, but I, I never, I, I didn't meet her. This as a child, it was just another lady that was here. Benjamin Allen and his brother lived here for three years when his family couldn't support them. He grew up to become a vice president at Edison Brothers and would himself head up the Annie Malone board. I think Annie Malone's existence is, is, is probably the glue that helped maintain this area. Uh, and, and the need will always be there because uh, the, 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 the world we live in, uh, and there's always a place uh, to pull families together uh, uh, and, and to a place for refuge. Like the Ville neighborhood itself, Annie Malone's business had emerged and prospered in an era of segregation. As changes came, bigger national companies began to market their products to African American women. Yet still, for many years, aging Poro agents would get together like sorority sisters. Because for many of them, being a Poro agent had been more than just a job. The Poro concept was one to try to empower women. Her original philosophy was to talk to each and every woman and encourage them to find their own inner beauty. Um, she congratulated the people who were Poro agents of hers um, by encouraging them to buy property. Uh, to make investments in organizations. We did that story a number of years ago, and Linda Nance has since left her position at the children's home, but she remains committed to telling the story of its founder. She has set up the Annie Malone Historical Society, collecting and maintaining information and archives, and telling the story of Annie Malone to new generations. In May 1957, the week Rosa Parks was coming to St. Louis to talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, Annie Malone passed away in Chicago at the age of 87. The papers here noted her wealth and her philanthropy. Once they said she was the richest Negro in St. Louis, one of the first in the city to own a Rolls Royce. Rags to riches, a real Cinderella story, one said. Today, though, there are those who want people to know that this was no fairy tale castle and that Annie Malone was much more than just a name. <laughs>